Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast. I'm Gavin Shaw, and today I'll be joined once again by Jake Rosen of Cerebro Sports to continue talking what the Knicks might do with the 11th pick in the draft, a debate about whether the Knicks should re-sign Mitchell Robinson or maybe draft a certain center who could replicate large portions of his skill set, and then finally some thoughts on Jalen Brunson. All that and more right now on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks. Your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, and today's episode is brought to you by BetOnline. BetOnline now has more props, odds, and lines than ever before. BetOnline, where the game starts. And who's talking to you? I'm Gavin Shaw, a play-by-play broadcaster, literally about to leave to go broadcast for lacrosse games today. But before I do that, I had to get you guys this episode. I am once again joined by Jake Rosen of Cerebro Sports. Uh, just flat out, one of the best draft writers, one of the draft, one of the best draft thinkers out there. Uh, someone I absolutely love talking basketball with. I hope that comes across in this very fun conversation. I won't delay it any longer. Let's get right into it with Jake. And to that point, another person that I think fits in that mold, but I'm curious to see if you fit in that mold is Malachi Brandon, who's flat out one of my favorite prospects in this draft. Uh, We've we've touched on him a few times, haven't gone super in depth, obviously um, hyper, hyper efficient. And I just, I like the way, like, I mean, uh, as someone who didn't see a lot of him, but watch that NCAA tournament game, he just seemed, he he just seems like someone who's unbothered at the college stage. And I feel like that'll translate to the NBA where he knows who he is. He knows how to get to his spots and he knows how to make shots when he gets to those spots. Yeah, I mean, before we talk about Brandon, I do want to make one quick point because, you know, yeah. part of why the NBA playoffs are so much – like, I, there's nothing I love more. I mean, I obviously love college basketball and, like, I love scouting, yeah. love AAU stuff. But the NBA playoffs are so fun to me and especially this finals. And I've, like – I've fallen victim to, like, oh, this is what wins in the final. Like, this is what wins in the playoffs. Like, don't draft bigs anymore. And it's not about that because each postseason is so different. But, like, one thing that is incredibly constant in every single team is, like, you watch these possessions that are – created by the star whether that be Shaw's uh paint touches or Tatum shot and the ball ping pongs the defense rotates and like at some point like it's going to end up in Marcus Smart's hands or it ends up in Grant Williams hands or it ends up in Andrew Wiggins hands and it's like are you going to shoot the catch and shoot three are you going to drive and attack this closeout what decision do you make once you get inside to the defense and like the part that I used to get so hung up on and now I'm just like I was going to recognize I was wrong is like oh there's one way to do this like you have to get you have to run pick and roll you have to do this like you don't like we've seen like the yeah the maps have their flaws for whatever you know it's just a lot of but however you throw the defense in rotation like there's plenty of ways to do that um whether it be tough shot make whether it be st- iso stand so creative paint touches whether it be the warriors gorgeous movement offense based on as long as you are rotating the defense and then you have the guys to capitalize on that you're gonna be good obviously like you know you have to have the dudes um and i don't i think you know that's something where i'm like focused on the knicks is getting the guys to then capitalize on that. But the biggest reason why like the Knicks foundation didn't work was because Julius Randle didn't send defenses into rotation. It was entirely in a vacuum. Um, so, you know, that's something to look to like focus on moving forward. And that's why like I'm hell bent on just like getting the supporting cast because other, if it's not Jaden Ivy, like I don't see necessarily see someone in this draft that's going to substantially move the needle when it comes to sending the defenses into rotation. Um, so what can you do? You get the rest of the guys who can capitalize and it might not look as like pretty as you hope in year one or year two, but you you hope that once you get the right guy and you get the right or you get the right system, who knows? Like there are so many ways to do this. It's like the realization I've come to and why bat and basketball is so much more fun that way, where you're like, yeah. oh, you can do it this way, you can do it this way, you can do it this way. Um, but just knowing like the end result and like I think it's this is really important to guys like Branham and Davis. Like this is why I like Branham a lot. Um, he's someone who does have a lot of flaws. Like he does not necessarily get to the room does not create to get self created run attempts, but is a ridiculously efficient and capable mid-range pull-up shooter. And I think someone who has a ton of shooting potential, um, like shot 40% from three, didn't take a ton, but like, it's not because he needs time and space to get it off. Like, I think you just need to be in his ear and be like, dude, just green light, shoot, shoot, shoot. Um, There are a ton of clips that I pulled when I'm scouting Branham where he catches and lets it fly just like that. Um, and snap a finger. And then there are other ones where he's a little bit more hesitant. Um, whether it be on a kick out or in transition, you know, he's not necessarily wired. Like something I love about Agbaji, I don't necessarily think Agbaji is like the guy from the Knicks, but the thing I love about Agbaji, like if he saw daylight this year, it was going up no matter what. 
Um, and, and like, I just think that like you don't necessarily just sweep that under the rug. That's very important, especially when it comes to complimentary shooters is honoring advantages that are provided so many times. Like Draymond Green is my favorite player. It, it, like Draymond Green and Luca are my two favorite players. Draymond has mm-hmm. been my guy. It kills me. Like watching last night, the ball gets swung and Draymond just like can't punish rotations. Um, like hey, Dr- Draymond and Iggy on the, out there on the same time, and them two are just ping ponging and just like don't punish rotations. Um, now he gets lucky because he gets to turn to Steph Curry and set a quick uh, pin in, um, because his defender is literally under the brim. But you gotta punish the rotations. Um, and. I think if Malachi can up that green light where he becomes someone who, you know, it's going to take a while before he gets to like that three level score at the rim. But as I said, like there's definitely value in someone who's going to be a spacer um, and then just be able to kill and create tough shots uh, in that mid range area. And uh, he's, he has a great positional size. Like that's what I like about him compared to someone like Ty Ty um, is that like Branham is a legit six, five to me. I mean, he's big and he's completely unbothered by, you know, quick hit, like little taps or, someone in his airspace, he's going to rise up and he's going to gun it over your contest. Um, and usually he's going to make it. Uh, he's really, really impressive. And someone I would like, if the Knicks took him at 11, I, you know, I'd prefer Davis um, because I think Johnny is further along both as a creator and especially as a defender. Um, so if they were both on the board, I think you're kind of gunning for the same type of complementary skill set. I would take Davis for both those reasons. But Branham is someone uh, that, you know, I wouldn't be too mad about. He's It's like worries do you think he's like a little similar to Deuce? I haven't talked about Deuce yet. I just like Deuce. I'm very and like Grant. Yeah. So we have a lot of complimentary guys. Um, I, I do think the Knicks are like the young core. It's like <laughs> the Knicks fans are so funny to me because it's like everyone loves to hate on the Knicks because they're such like, um, you know, it's an easy franchise to pick on. But it's kind of like the Knicks young core is likely somewhere in between the middle of the Knicks fans screaming that we have this we all these guys and like the mainstream media like the knicks are a joke and have no future it's like probably somewhere in the middle where you know we have a lot of yeah. intriguing pieces and you know we should just continue to add to that and i think branham absolutely fits um a lot of good there's a lot of good candidates at 11. I, I wasn't you know i wasn't too upset that the knicks like of all years didn't move up if we weren't going to move up into the top four then stay put at 11. um a lot of these guys yeah. are somewhat interchangeable for me and actually uh you know the guys i like for the knicks branham davis um, during, as we'll, we'll talk about, are kind of projected to fall, you know, red in our laps, I'd say, compared to some other prospects who might go uh, six, seven, or eight. Um, another another one of those guys who could potentially drop a little bit, uh, AJ Griffin. And I'm curious, yeah. does he separate himself at all in your mind from a guy like Branham in that there maybe is a higher ceiling outcome there because I, I know the the deal with him was was someone who had kind of nuclear athleticism at points in high school but also suffered like a, a two I think different season ending injuries uh obviously is just like flat out like at least at least in terms of the numbers one of the better shooting prospects for his age like in the last couple of years like just insane efficiency at Duke but is there like given that size given the athleticism that he, he flashed at some earlier ages is there a higher ceiling bet there that might lead him to go ahead of the knicks or if he's there might make him like a really good bet for the knicks is if they could say the baseline is just like another stud three and d guy and like the ceiling is is something really really interesting or or do you think the reason he's going to fall is because teams are realizing like you know there isn't there isn't quite that much there beyond the shooting i think he could definitely fall i mean i just wrote about aj i like him a lot um i think he's a safe bet to be a positive nba player for a long time in large part due to you just don't have a ton of shooters at that frame and he's going to shoot the freaking cover off the ball like that is there's no doubt in my mind um as you've mentioned the shooting profile at duke is absolutely nutty um yes he's a wide base but the way he does like these little things which are just so unorthodox and weird like he'll catch the ball and like do a stutter rip and it's like stutter jab and then just rise up into a shot just like what like, that is so and hard and he just makes it look so easy so as a shooter absolutely nuclear uh, i'd say he's the best shooter in the class um and potentially one of the best shooters like, in, like three years taking this super seriously so mm-hmm. for the knicks like i think he would be a home run pick I, i'm a little more skeptical of the upside stuff just because he is really hampered as an athlete like his first step is not there at all um and his handle is just like not really there either so i'm a little more skeptical of him being like a secondary creator uh rather than someone like davis or even branham but 
if you're going to run him, like defenders are going to try to run him off a lot uh, and he's going to be put in very advantageous situations where, as a creator. I think he's someone who's going to rely a lo- on a little bit more scheme uh, from his coaching staff, wherever he's put in to run him off actions and put him in situations. Like if you just throw him in the, if you just stick him in the corner, he's going to like be an incredible floor spacer. But I think like, you're not going to make the defense react in the way that they should totally. And like Duke, like Duke had a ton of flashes doing both of the, like on both ends of the spectrum where they would just like sit him in the corner and like the offense would get a little stagnant and I'm just like run AJ like throw some off ball screens at AJ like make the defense react and then they also you know later in the season got in a great habit of consistently running him off pin downs um letting him curl and get downhill because he is a capable finisher when he gets to the rim he's a great frame he's great touch he can even win in the like short mid range areas a really good tough shot maker. And uh, he just, the problem is he just like can't really get by the first layer of defense if he isn't really given it on a player, which is totally okay um, as a complimentary player, especially when you shoot the ball like he does. But I do think um, he'd be a great fit for the Knicks. And uh, I, if he fell, um, I, I would be very happy if the Knicks took him. All right, guys, we'll be back with Jake in just a sec. I want to start getting into a little bit of an interesting debate with him because he's, he's a big fan of Jalen Duran. And I'm like, dude, we got Mitchell Robinson. We're set. But we, we we have a nice little back and forth on it. So I'll leave it to you guys to watch. But first, I want to make you all some money. And there's only one place I know you can do that with relative ease. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, news and odds, including this year's basketball championship matchup, the NHL hockey conference finals, Major League Baseball, and of course, all the leading fighting news from MMA, UFC, and boxing. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. Personally, I'm going to go on there, and it, it pains me to do this, guys, but I'm, I'm going to pour some money on the Boston Celtics. I think that series is over. Jason Tatum literally went, what was it, 3 for 17, and they still win on the road? I don't know. I think they're going to win this series. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, let's, let's circle to a guy you, you just hit on, uh, Jalen Duran. I think there is a segment of Knicks fans, and I'll, I'll raise my hand, that would be kind of disappointed if the Knicks take a center. If he's, I mean, to your point, I'm like, uh, I guess, a, a million ways to win in the NBA. Like, there, there's this whole notion. Like, I think someone put out, like, a tweet that um, there was one team playing a guy bigger than 6'10 consistently in the conference finals, and it was Maxi Kleba. And there, there's this notion that you don't really win with centers unless it's unless it's just a superstar, right? like a Jokic or an Embiid. And I think Knicks fans would say, hey, we, we just we, we lucked out. We just got Jericho Sims, who is potentially like the ideal modern stopgap in that position if he continues to develop. We could just re-sign Mitchell Robinson at a fairly reasonable number. We've already invested so much time in him. He brings some real qualities to the table. W- what is the case for the New York Knicks taking a center? I mean, the case is for me personally is that I'm just lower on those two guys. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I would say, like, yes, we've invested in Mitchell Robinson, but he was a second round pick and Jericho Sims is an undrafted free agent. We haven't, and I'm under the oh, uh, whoa, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. 58th pick, 58th, uh, 58th pick, 58th pick. My bad. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, no. <laughs> so are we really, are we really burning assets? We take another center at 11 and I'm, and you know, I'm someone who like, I know a lot of people who are much higher on Dern than me. I don't super love his game. And a big reason for that is I'm not super optimistic about the offense. He's not a very good shooting projection. The feel is kind of like moments of really high feel, moments of super low feel. Um, isn't necessarily a big time post scorer, but what he he is a ridiculous defensive prospect. And I do think like, yes, we talked about, you're not winning with a center. Like what, what if I told you Jalen Durham is only six, nine and a half. Uh, he's a very small, like, small height wise but extremely versatile and i you know you look at what is successful around the league right now and it's, it's being able to play multiple coverages and being able to get to the level of being also play drop and, and i think duran at his best is someone who gives you a ton of defensive flexibility you know just last night we saw obviously playing against the warriors and steph curry is different but rob will just like wasn't really hanging on the perimeter Al- Horford got in there and mucked things up and, you know, flipped the game on its head, among other other reasons, but that was a big part of it. Um, being able to get to the level, being able to have defensibility is so in this in today's NBA. And I think, you know, Duran probably coming in at the perfect time from a defensive standpoint. So I, I think the pitch for Duran is, you know, we're no longer messing around. Like we're no longer hoping that Mitch Robb is the is 
who we want him to be. Um, you're not relying on like New Orleans was good, but you're not relying on these one or two year stop gaps. Like you're getting your defensive anchor. Um, and I think Duran has the potential to do just that. I know for a lot of Knicks fans, like getting a defensive prospect probably isn't the most like heartwarming thing given our offensive struggles over the past few years. But you know, you as I said, can all can address all your needs at once. Um, and if you feel that. Duran is, you know, I don't want to say a sure thing because nothing's ever a sure thing, but given his tools and effectiveness uh, operating in multiple coverages and as a primary, like he is a primary rim protector to me. Uh, just he is like, yeah, well, he's only probably six, nine and a half, six, ten, uh, ridiculous wingspan, ridiculous standing reach, and incredible leaper. So I, I do we talk about compensation. He might not be a seven footer, but he's getting off the ground quicker and he's reaching that apex just as quickly, if not quicker, as a seven footer. Uh, who has similar measurements just because of how quick and instinctive he is. So Duran is someone who, you know, I'm, I've grown increasingly, uh, I've gravitated towards him more for the Knicks, just because I do think he fills a hole that we ne haven't necessarily invested in. Like I, I'm not in the building. I don't know how they feel about Grimes or Deuce. I worry about like Grimes is going to space the floor, but I do worry about his ancillary skills when it comes to attack and closeouts and redraft and things of that i like deuce um it's one i really i had him like top 20 in the class last year um but of course he's six two and not necessarily a primary he is someone that i do think can flourish if uh it all comes together as a cop like as a complimentary off guard who can really defend can space the floor and then can maybe attack and get to some pull-ups but obviously he has concerns getting all the way to the rim and guards you don't get to the rim we already have one of those <laughs> and so how many can you really play at one time and if you're looking around, and while I think, you know, Johnny and Malachi and, uh, I mean, Johnny is probably, like, my go-to bet. Um, yeah. But, uh, like, Durin is, like, if you're not totally sold on Malachi and you're not totally sold on AJ and, and like, I would, again, I would take AJ and Johnny. And, but if you're not totally sold on either one of those guys, like, I think Durin is just an easy guy to slide in and say, like, this is our defensive center. Like, this is our anchor and we're going to build, we're going to build the backcourt out now, but we have like our guy. Yeah. I think it's interesting because you, you, you told me this a year ago, I'd kind of be shaking my head. I said, I would I'd kind of be like, no, I think Mitchell Robinson is that guy. Because I think before we put on all the weight, he did have this great flexibility to jump out on the mm -hmm. corner. It was kind of tough because they mostly used him in drop in Tibbs's first year, but yeah. when he had chances to flash. Like, obviously we all know his first two years in the NBA, he was, he was just a maven blocking three pointers. Like one of the few bigs I've ever seen, like get to James Harden, step back and just swat it. And I remember like that was his rookie year. I remember Harden just giving this look like, did, did this guy really just do that? Who, who is this guy? What's his name again? <laughs> and, and then he put on, he put on this weight and he really became like, there were, as the year went along, there were still, there were moments of that. Right. And, and you could, you could look at the numbers and say like the Knicks were a, a top three defensive team in the NBA down the stretch of the season. Was that a little like smoke and mirrors? Was it like a little bit weighted by the last like eight, nine, 10 games? Was it, was it Tibbs? I mean, maybe not getting enough credit and just doing an exceptionally good job with the personnel that he had. I don't know, but I, I liked, I liked the way Mitch started moving by the end of the season. I loved what Sims did. I mean, there were times where he showed really well. And I think it was buoyed by the fact that he was playing a lot of that time with Deuce and quickly who were so smart in terms of like how they helped him and, and kind of like drove guards into his direction. He has this great verticality at the rim, but I, I hear the pitch because Duran is like, you don't have to say like, will Sims as like an older guy, like, will he figure all those things out and get there? Will Mitch fully regain his athleticism? Like, no, you have that guy. And unlike Mitch, you, you pay him not a whole lot of money. The first four years he's in the league. And I, I think the Knicks have underrated defensive personnel maybe that's me being a fan and being like a little bit a little bit too bullish on some of these guys but I think if they all develop as they get more seasoned like they're just drafting smart dude after smart dude and earlier in the podcast I was talking about on the, on the offensive end I think defensively that's true too so having a five who's just locked down both at the rim and on the perimeter to complement all those guys I, I I hear you I think it's a I think it's a compelling fit um I'll just leave it to you is, is there anyone else you want to throw out there um for the Knicks first pick who you think could be an interesting fit no, I mean, I do, I do want to talk about Darren a little bit more because he's super fascinating to me because it does, yeah. it is growing like increasingly. I don't want to say likely, but the opportunity that he might be there for the Knicks is growing much more apparent than I would have thought um, about like, two yeah. months ago. Mitch contract extensions, like, where do you stand on that? Like, where does what does the second contract look like? Yeah, I, I think that's that's the whole concern, right? That there's another team, like whether it's like the Pistons or or maybe even someone like the Suns, if if they trade Aiton, like or, or some other wild card, that they can push it too far. I think 
something similar to what uh, Robert Williams got is reasonable, like 13, 14, 15 million, maybe even 16. Because he does have these elite skills, right? Like he he's very good around the rim. He is flat out, like maybe like the best, obviously not finisher in terms of like at volume, but like the most efficient right. at the rim player in NBA history statistically was pretty transcendent as an offensive rebounder last year. And that was, that was the whole thing that I think killed them down the second half of um, the 21 season when Nerland Noel became the guy after Mitch got hurt. Like they just, they'd lost that. And I think, I, I think there, there were things he does that were very underappreciated that especially because the Knicks just weren't very good despite them, that if he were gone would come back to bite the Knicks in the ass a little bit. But there's also there's just so many flaws and like it just it's just so clear at this point like he is who he is offensively right like he w- once a year he'll get the ball thirty feet out and, and sprint by his center and get a dunk and you're like oh if he could just do that <laughs> three times a game but it just it, it's it sort of fool me once right it's it's not going to happen with him at this point so I'm not as much as I love him and he was we were I remember the first year we were doing this podcast we were calling it locked on Mitchell Robinson every year. So we, we we just love the guy <laughs> that much I I just I don't know like how much better he's gonna get his screens suck. So if they can get someone better at that, that would be big, especially with to your point guards who don't get a lot of separation naturally. Um, there, there's a there's a world to upgrade on, but if they don't, if they just say, all right, we're just going to roll with Nerlens, Jericho, and Taj, I think this team is actually going to be worse next season, pending what else they do, because he he does some things that are not easily replaced. I com- no, I completely agree. I personally would not put out 15 mil for him. Like it's yeah, personally not where I'm at, and I, I think you have to think about these things like it's not you're not just drafting the board like obviously you're building a team so i don't know how the knicks feel about mature robinson what i will say is that like if they are wary of extent like don't want to extend him and they're comfortable letting him go which like yes of course you don't want to lose someone for nothing but that is the reality of you know restrictive free agency and and, like that's just you know the game you play i i think duran makes a lot of sense now if you're if you're hell bent on we're going to resign this guy we we're comfortable with him him. he's like or even if you know we go two or three million per year more than what we're comfortable with like we're going to go through restrictive free agency we're not going to do the extension and we're just like going to gut this out then taking Durham makes absolutely no sense like spending if you're investing in mitchell robinson which like i might disagree with but that's your that's your choice like these two things don't make sense together but i'm saying like as someone who isn't necessarily optimistic about mitchell robinson's second contract this is like a very intriguing pivot to me where it's like I'm going to cut my losses like this was like we tried to make it work. We tried to develop like this isn't I'm not in love with this here. Like here's another option to like give me something similar. But like we're going to start fresh with a new developmental path. Like that's something that's intriguing to me. Um, I know a lot of Knicks fans might might disagree. The Knicks themselves might disagree. Um, It's kind of all where you stand. If you're like we can agree to disagree on Mitch. But I and I will like side with you if you're like yeah i want to extend mitch yeah well, we're not taking Duran. that makes no sense but if you don't i, I think Duran presents an interesting bridge and uh pivot in which you can acquire someone who i believe like is capable of anchoring a defense at a, at a high level um and then kind of worry about building out the creation in the future yeah it wouldn't it wouldn't break my heart i'm not i'm definitely not a, totally attached to mitchell robinson at this point um let, let's let's wrap up on this because we we have not at all touched on the Knicks second pick in this draft at, at 42 on this podcast. Are there any sleepers in that general vicinity who you potentially like for the Knicks? And this is an area as we, we've noted, the Knicks have done exceptionally well. And I mean, getting Jericho um, this past draft, uh, Deuce and, and Rokas were, were in that obviously earlier in the second round, but in that general vicinity, this is a really, really high level scouting team, whether they get credit for it from a league wide perspective or not. Um, if you were, if you were part of that staff, uh, who, who are some of the names you'd be throwing out there for those, for that pick? Um, So someone I really like for the Knicks, like, I don't even know. It, it might be worth like, it's just such a, it's like another complimentary guard. So it's tough. I don't think he'll be there at 42, but like Duke's Trevor Keels is, is someone that I like someone who was very aggressive, like, and confident on the ball, NBA ready frame. Doesn't necessarily have the pop or athleticism, but I think he's a better shooter than he showed at Duke. Has some secondary creation chops, some, some that you can side IQ. Um, again, is not necessarily going to solve your issue for paint touches, but can hopefully space the floor, run some second side actions, and, and I think can maybe stick around and be an NBA player uh, in that early second round range. Um, I'm trying to th- think. We're just looking forward. Uh, the gambles, like, aren't necessarily there. Um, I'm trying yeah. to think about who's going to be there at 42. Um, I I know some people are big fans of, oh, I have someone. Um, Andrew oh, Nemhard. Cool. Andrew Nemhard. Yeah, there you uh, go. Nice. Gonzaga. 
Um, that's I I don't look. We're talking about a older six one and a half, six two ground bound point guard, but absolutely exceptional and exceptional for the Zags. Like he's going to cost you in the middle of the second round pick. If you go look at the draft, like I love this more than anyone. Um, I, I watch all these guys, but go look, go on Wikipedia and and look at what you're working with past forty. Like it's tough. You know, you're you're lucky to get anyone who's been sick. So someone who needs primary ball hand, a team that needs primary ball handling. Uh, I think he's your perfect flyer, Nembhard. And I think ideally he's someone that can you know, play alongside other guards despite being small because he is a big-time shooter uh, and can space the floor. doesn't necessarily need the ball in his hands, but is very competent running pick and rolls and just uh, a super competent and effective produ- like, and he produced at a very high level, obviously, at Gonzaga. So he would be my target, uh, honestly, at 42. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of his game as well. I saw someone maybe maybe this is exaggerating it, but coming out of the combine, I remember someone tweeting like one of the best pick and roll guards in this draft, like flat out. And um, oh, I, I would agree. I would agree with that. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean more more so maybe a testament to the class and lack of ball handlers that yeah. you can get one of the best pick and roll handlers in the second. But no, absolutely deserves his credit, and I don't have any issues with that statement at all. Yeah, I know. I think I think adding like a savvy backup at that position, given that the Knicks were often using Alec Burks in that role, is is an understated. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Team. Obviously, you you have Derrick Rose coming back, but there are very real questions about like I mean, the guy he's just suffered a million injuries at this point. Uh, but especially if the Knicks decide to move off him and move off that money, or like go after someone like Jalen Brunson, like I I'd like him as as maybe a a third guy in that mix. Obviously, also depending on what you think of Deuce and where where Deuce will play and if Deuce can be off ball. But Jake, that is probably a conversation for another day. Another day. I well, while I have you, I, oh, I, no, I, please, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I don't talk to a ton of Knicks fans, so when I have yeah. one, I, I got to ask questions. Uh, Jalen yeah, Brunson, obviously Rick Brunson. Uh, we heard the yeah. news. Um, how do you feel about? How do you feel about uh, that potential acquisition? I don't know. Well, we we touched on it a little bit yesterday. I don't know. There's still there's just a lot of reporting that like I mean, again, Jake Fisher. A shout out to him. Uh, had it that like it seems like a, there's a consensus around the league that he's going to end up staying in Dallas. Like. I think he really yeah. likes playing with Luca. I think that run probably further solidified things. Um, it depends. And, and other people have said this. It, it sort of comes down to like, does he envision himself as a primary? And does he say, hey, I can't I can't hit my ceiling as a basketball player playing next to Luca Doncic? Or does he say, and I think this is probably more realistic, like this is the best possible scenario for me. Like like Luca is sort of the, the ultimate shield in terms of the types of defenders that get thrown his way and, and like the type of attention he gets and like the looks he gets like against the scramble defense, like, I sort of think he's in his perfect spot there. So I would, I very much understand him staying in Dallas. I don't, I don't think like the Knicks throwing, I mean, to your point on like the Knicks throwing Mitchell Robinson, 15 million. I don't know if throwing 25 million, his direction is, is just like the best allocation of money, but it, it's sort of the rule I always have with trades and free agency. Like if you sign a guy to a deal that you think is tradable, then it doesn't matter if you're overpaying him. And I, I think he, unless it's a crazy, crazy, crazy number, I do think it'd be tradable. And in terms of, again, just like that additive, IQ and skill he's such an interesting fit and like and him and quickly is probably disastrous defensively but offensively <laughs> man like I I just think I just think it's so interesting to add someone who's that smart who can really shoot and who is just I mean from day one right easily the best isolation guy on the Knicks in terms of his ability to do that efficiently like RJ can eat up a lot of those possessions but he's still not not created it yet like Brunson is really really good at that I wonder what it looks like outside of Dallas but um, I, I, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here, but I, I don't, I don't need, I'm not going to be heartbroken if he stays in Dallas, but if the Knicks go get him, I'm, I'm going to just be excited to watch that guy play for the Knicks next year. Where, where, where are you at on that? Yeah, no, I, I think I agree with you. I think like, um, older, like past me would have been like, Oh, don't throw the money. Don't throw the money. He didn't solve your problems, but it's like, dude, let's, let's get to a good basketball player. Like let's roll yeah. and let's see what it looks like. Um, I do think it's less, I think I've seen a lot of people, like I do follow a lot of Knicks fans on my timeline. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I caught uh, the ones who are very optimistic about this deal happening, but it seemed like, Oh, we got Rick. We're getting Jalen. Like, let's go. I personally, like, I don't think it's that simple at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dallas can offer him another year. They can offer him more money. I, I don't see, obviously we're not inside Dallas front office. Like, I think, and I've just talked about this with people all the time, like Dallas, all we've been harping on is Luca needs a secondary, Luca needs a secondary. You found your secondary. Why on earth would you let him walk and not offer him like whatever he wants? Now we're talking about overpaying. Like you have Luca Doncic, and I don't, maybe Jalen is not the answer, but I don't, I would be extremely hard pressed that Dallas would see the run they just made and not give him whatever he wants. I don't think Brunson's the problem. I think, you know, those wings, I think that's probably where they could 
shirk up some things. But yeah, it's going to be very interesting. I, I don't think us getting Rick automatically correlates uh, to us getting Jalen, especially when, as you said, like he's a winner. He wants to win. He's won his entire life. Um, I don't know his aspirations. I don't talk to him. We're not friends like that. But uh, I would assume that it, like playing alongside Luka Doncic, just like while it has its uh, cons, he's a very ball dominant player. I think Jalen's gotten a lot of freedom and has proven his worth. So it's going to be really interesting. And uh, I think his decision, as you noted, will tell us a lot about what he thinks about one himself and his ultimate aspirations as a player. Yeah, it does. I wonder if who the Knicks draft will will tell you something about where they're at on that. I mean, I think it could, like if they take, if they go Johnny Davis direction or trade up for an Ivy, maybe you're like, oh, we're not getting that guy, but they take a, a wing with less creation ability. You're like, oh, I wonder if they, if they know something. So that'll, that'll certainly be something to watch. But uh, Jake, we'll, we'll be sure to have you on to talk about all of it uh, after the draft. Before I let you go, can you just tell everyone one more time um, where they can find your work and, and maybe what you have coming down the pipeline and what, what you put out recently? Absolutely. So uh, recently, so I'm, where you can find me on Twitter at Jake in the paint. Uh, that stuff, all my work is kind of funneled through there with them tweeting uh, stats, clips, takes about prospects. Obviously we're in the prime time stretch now. Um, I'm working for Cerebro sports this summer, producing content uh, this June. Me and as I mentioned, good friend of the program, PD Webb are going to be pumping out a lot of content. Um, I'm going to be doing some individual like player deep dives, or I'm actually working on something, a uh, comparison piece between Jeremy Sohan and Tar Eason to uh, verse uh, modern forwards who actually are hanging around in the Knicks range. So we'll see if uh, they entertain either one of those options. Um, I just published a piece on AJ Griffin. Have some, I think I'm going to put some pressure on myself. And like, I think I'm trying to get out, in addition to the Sohan and Tari piece, uh, three more on uh, some press we talked about today. So um, yeah, stay tuned for that. Uh, shoot me a DM if you ever want to talk ball. I'm open and love to engage with people. So, yeah, thank you for having me. This is always a ton of fun. Love talking Knicks. Love talking Knicks and prospects. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can get a good one on draft night. Jake, uh, one of the best. Uh, I think I threw out the precocious neophyte term last time. You might you might have had it. <laughs> I, I don't know. But uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep throwing it your way if you like it. Uh, thanks so much, man. And, and thank you for everyone who uh, tuned in. As always, uh, please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Please subscribe on YouTube. Uh, throw us a rating. Throw us a like wherever you can at all. Oh, wait, can I? Can yeah, I give one more thing? I, yeah, yeah. I always forget this. I don't know how. Such a disservice. Uh, one of my good friends, Mark Schindler, and I, we are doing it. We do a weekly draft podcast. So now more oh, than ever, cool. uh, you should you should tune into that. It's called Tag the Roll, wherever you get your prospects, at Tag the Roll on Twitter, Spotify, Apple. Um, we are going to be pumping heavy content. We're kind of working through position groups now, comparing, contrasting all those guys. Uh, we just published an episode. I think it actually went up while we were recording. So yeah, go check that out on Tari. Sohan and uh, Keegan Murray. There's kind of those like modern fours. Um, we're going to be recording some about the bigs next week and then kind of just going to trickle down through the draft. So go give that a listen, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff. Um, and again, thank you for having me. It's a ton of fun. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mar Mark also does great stuff. I always shows up my Twitter timeline. I'm always like, oh, yeah, good thought. Good, good. Tweet. Mark's the very, right, we'll, absolutely. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll be sure to have him on as well. Maybe, maybe both of you guys, you know, as we could do a crossover episode. <laughs> uh, until next time, uh, thank you so much for listening, everyone, and uh, be good. Peace out.